Welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Matt Healy. Uh, I'm one of the members of the festival uh, organizing group uh, and I'll be your host uh, today along with uh, Natalie Arthur as well. Um, before I go any further though, uh, I would like to um, firstly acknowledge the Wurundjeri people uh, of the Kulin Nation uh, who are the traditional owners of the land upon which I'm joining you today. Um, and I would like to also extend that respect to uh, other Indigenous peoples here who are present, um, but also uh, the lands upon which you are all joining from uh, as well and pay my respects and acknowledgements there too. Uh, I would like to also acknowledge that this week is National Reconciliation Week. Um, and in particular, the theme for this year is uh, now more than ever, um, which uh, I think is a particularly important theme uh, in a variety of ways. Um, and it reminds us that you know, the fight for, for justice and the rights of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people um, is one that is ongoing uh, and needs to, to continue uh, as we all need to work towards um, better, better outcomes for uh, Indigenous peoples here and also in other parts of the world as well. Um, so welcome to uh, what is, I think, the technically fifth session of uh, this year's festival. Um, before I go any further, though, I would like to uh, acknowledge that I do have a guest here with me, uh, and all presuming well with my technology. Um, they will be doing an initial primer um, for this, uh, this uh, session. Hey, everyone. Today, we're diving into a hot topic. Do the benefits of AI and evaluation outweigh the risks? You've probably seen content or used platforms and been influenced by a computer algorithm. Sounds futuristic, right? But is it fair? Let's unpack this. Why might evaluators use AI? It boils down to efficiency. AI can do hundreds of routine tasks, freeing up evaluators' time for the harder stuff. Critics argue AI can't understand human creativity or nuanced arguments. Imagine writing a beautiful piece on Shakespeare only to be downgraded because the AI didn't get your poetic analysis. Frustrating, right? Proponents point out AI's consistency. It treats every answer with the same parameters. But what about biases in AI? AI learns from human data which can be biased, leading to unfair treatment. What do you think? Is the use of AI in evaluation justified or a step too far? And where do I stand, you might ask? You'll have to wait till the end. Welcome to the AI in Evaluation Great Debate with your hosts, Matt Healy and Natalie Arthur. Now that might surprise you to know that I did not create that. Um, that was created by one of the many uh, free and varied platforms uh, available that can uh, create wonderfully artistic and clearly not, um, you know, just junky uh, things um, from a very vague prompt. Um, but uh, it does provide you a bit of a sense of where things are, are going. Uh, and I think something that is worth uh, us all considering uh, is, you know, this important question of uh, effectively do the benefits of AI and evaluation outweigh the risks? So today we're going to debate this topic. We're not going to just have a whole bunch of presenters. Um, so we have six uh, speakers in total divided into two teams. Um, so on the four team, we have uh, David Fetterman, uh, Aaron Rashid and Gerard Atkinson. Uh, and on the against team, we have Christy Hornby, Seville Kushner, and Michael Notel. Um, so they have carefully and uh, laboriously uh, determined what their arguments are, spending many, many voluntary hours uh, undoubtedly <laughs> debating this topic amongst themselves. Um, and so they're here to prepare or to um, present, I should say, those crafted arguments uh, to you all. In terms of the structure of this, um, once I hand over to the first speaker, uh, they will have uh, a maximum of five minutes to present their points. Um, I'll be sort of flagging with them uh, using the virtual raised hand feature at the four minute mark to basically flag that they need to be wrapping up. Um, we'll basically go back and forth in the traditional uh, tit for tat style. Um, at the tail end, we will then have some time for questions. So as we're going through the debate, you're welcome to, to flag questions that you have for the group that are debating um, and I would encourage if you see questions that are, you know, particularly poignant or, or interesting, um, you're welcome to react with them um, so that my co-host Natalie can um, make note of those. Uh, and she will then facilitate a bit of a panel discussion with the group at the end. Um, perhaps the most important thing, though, is who's going to win. 
Uh, and rather than myself deciding, of course, even though that's something I would love to do, uh, we are instead going to be very democratic about this. Um, so there will be a poll option at the end um, for those of you here in attendance to basically share who you think won out of the two teams. Um, there is also, uh, in the spirit of this debate, a special guest judge um, at the end as well who will be voicing their views um, uh, as well. So with that, uh, I will leave you with the prompt question before I then hand over to the first speaker. Um, the question guiding this debate and the one in which we're trying to address uh, or answer is, do the benefits of AI and evaluation outweigh the risks? Uh, and David Fetterman is going to be starting us off. Thank you. Appreciate that, Matt. I don't think we really have any choice. Uh, it's a yes. Uh, it's going to uh, go forward regardless. Uh, but the reasons for it, accuracy. I work in medicine and education uh, primarily. And in medicine, uh, AI has proved to be more accurate it's than seasoned diagnosticians, radiologists for x-rays, gastroenterologists concerning polyps and colons, ophthalmologists concerning retinal scans. Machines don't get tired. Uh, machines apply the same criteria uniformly across cases. In education, I submit requirements for a proposal and ask for a draft response. It doesn't miss any of the questions. It doesn't miss the numerical points that we always worry about associated with each question and reliably responds to each question. It's efficient. I've used AI to clean, interpret, and sort my large data sets in seconds, which usually takes me days, if not weeks. Try it yourself, by the way. Go to Kaggle, it's free, database, play with it yourself, and you will not believe how fast it is. Try it for yourself. It comes up with also useful logic models, theories of change, designed for relevant programs in seconds. Quality. I've written many books, chapters, and articles, and recently I submitted one of uh, my drafts to Microsoft's Copilot and uh, GPT-4. It improved my grammar. I'm embarrassed to admit, but it's true. And it helped me also pitch the same piece in different ways to different audiences very in a very compelling fashion. Also, we always driven crazy getting to the word limit for the abstracts. Does that in seconds. Democratization. All of the major chat boxes have free versions of chat, you know, like ChatGPT, Microsoft, Copilot, Gemini, et cetera, all designed to be user-friendly and use common everyday phrases to launch its inquiries. This means AI is accessible to all. The walls are coming down when it comes to access to knowledge, sorting large databases, and making sense. We can create our own GPTs. I have created my own GPT for empowerment evaluation and then simply added to it when I wanted vetted information that reduced the bias and the kinds of uh, things that we did not want uh, in there to just, you know, to make it less accurate, et cetera. So try it sometime if you want to play with it. Uh, I also find chat GPT in particular and, and Microsoft Copilot very useful when I'm conducting empowerment evaluations and I'm trying to build evaluation capacity by helping communities that don't have the funds and don't have the funds for evaluation or evaluators to come up with logic models, to come up with theories of change, et cetera. Surveys, obviously I can be a coach and a critical friend to help assist it, but they can take primary responsibility in that regard. Counter to those who argue we should walk away from AI, we don't walk away from problems in evaluation. We face them and we confront them head on. AI alignment with our values means staying in the game. The use of AI in evaluation outweighs the risk of being left behind. The world is moving forward with us or without us. For those who fear AI misuse, the solution is not withdrawal. The answer is inclusion. We need to make sure we invite people knowledgeable about their communities at the table as AI is developed, refined, and aligned with the values we cherish, including equity, equality, accuracy, fairness, and compassion. AI alignment with our values means staying in the game not walking away. Thank you. Thank you, David. Uh, and very succinct, much appreciated. Mm -hmm. um, so David has opened it for the full team. Uh, I would like to now throw to uh, the opening speaker for the against team, uh, Christy Hornby. So Christy, um, when you're ready, uh, and she will be spotlit momentarily. Uh, <laughs> take it away, Christy. Awesome. Morning all. Thanks, Matt. 
First, I'd just like to rebut David's points. You know, I, I think he's done a, a little bit of smoke and mirrors there, so I'd just like to address some of those claims that he's made. Um, he opened his statement by saying that, you know, we don't have a choice here. We always have a choice. We work predominantly in social services or health or other programs that are seeking to improve the lives of others. If we didn't seek to improve the lives of others, you know, we'd accept that their lot in life is to stay how they are. So we always have a choice. The other thing we do as evaluators is we don't follow things on blind faith just because other professions are doing so. Um, so we, we choose to use our judgment and our critical thinking and our capabilities in these areas to determine what's appropriate, what's ethical, and what um and what protects the sort of power dynamic power relationships that we've got. So, you know, AI is a, a lovely fun tool. It's fun to play around. It's a lovely hobby at the moment. Um, but for us in our profession as evaluators, we're not ready to adopt the technology. David also touched on its accuracy. I beg to differ. Um, so it is very good in those diagnostic tests that he talked about you know, simple sort of, you know, image recognition, but for our work as evaluators, drawing out nuance and making value judgments, it's not yet at the level of capability that we need it to be. It's also not efficient by the amount of time you need to spend playing with fine tuning, prompting, reprompting the machine and checking for, for errors. It does increase the risk of error. And in my session on Tuesday, I presented the results of a peer reviewed study released just last month that found that 50% of res results provided by one system were wrong. But most importantly, users didn't know those errors were made 40% of the time. How can we ensure that our work is, is free of error you know, when we're seeing this data here? Um, we've also got an especial duty in our profession for, the, for ethical conduct and, and management of privacy. So it's for those reasons that we contend that our profession doesn't yet have the capability to use AI in the way that it needs to be, that it's not yet valid, and that it sort of risks creating adverse impacts, which is the last thing we want to do. We also draw out our insights looking at other jurisdictions. So European Union, they're known for the world's greatest beer festival and nudity in public parks. They have decided to outright ban some applications of AI China, which is known for some shady commercial practices, has decided to outright ban some commercial uses of AI. If these large jurisdictions with the best legal techno technological uh, and regulatory minds in the world have decided that AI is too risky for them, what hope do we have in our profession, which isn't known as being traditionally tech savvy and sometimes can struggle to operate an Excel spreadsheet? In my session on Tuesday as well, I took a poll of the attendees and that poll found that 40% uh, of attendees rated themselves as less capable than the average person in using AI and 50% of attendees rated themselves less confident than the average person in using AI. And that was from a sample of evaluators who chose to attend a presentation on AI. So it's likely their level of capability and confidence is higher than the average across that profession regardless. I think we, with all this, it's really important to think about where we are as a profession. As, as a profession, let's think about how do we use this this technology. And I think it could be something useful in the future. But for now, it's a fun plaything. We don't have the capability to use it correctly to minimise that risk of error and to manage the risk of adverse impacts. Thanks for your consideration. Great. Thank you, Christy. Again, two for two, being succinct and keeping to time. This is great. Uh, so speaker number three, uh, or who is number two on the uh, the four side, uh, is Aram Rashid. Uh, so Aram, over to you. Five minutes, starting now. Thanks, Matt. And hi, everyone. Um, I hear your concerns, Christy, but I think that it really depends on what you're using AI for. When I started my career, I was doing RCTs. I don't use them as much anymore, but I still find the concept of counterfactual really useful in, uh, in assessing the costs and benefits. So today's world, we are living in that counterfactual. Imagine what would happen if things continued as they were. We have limited use of AI uh, or no use at all in evaluation. In this world, as an evaluator, especially so as an independent evaluator, I felt constrained 
there are time constraints, budget constraints, limited data, poor data quality, political constraints, contextual factors uh, that have often led me to play that game of balancing rigor against the real world realities that we operate in. Uh, these challenges often limit our ability to produce work that truly impacts policy and program design in a world grappling with systemic inequalities and human rights issues. AI to me offers an opportunity to overcome those limitations, a possibility to um, work with unparalleled amounts of data, generate deeper insights, a possibility to improve rigor, validity, reliability, and eventually utility of our evaluation findings. How so? Firstly, it enables us to reach to previously underrepresented and undersampled population groups. When we first got Alexa at our home, we could barely make use of it because it wouldn't understand our English accent. But today I can talk to ChatGPT in my mother tongue Urdu and it's pretty good at it. Uh, it understands complex languages, it responds in a similar way. So I'm very hopeful that the new feature of the ChatGPT that offers real time translation um, will allow us to seamlessly talk to people who don't speak the same language. We can use this tool to do consultations, interviews, focus groups with our diverse population groups. Imagine the possibility of not just including um, the underrepresented population in our samples, but having deeper conversations with them. Uh, imagine the impact this could have on policy making and program design if we could understand their unique needs and perspectives that comprehensively. Not just that, it offers many other possibilities, as David said, um, with automated transcription, automated text coding, um, and uh, let's say just the first cut of thematic analysis, it frees up significant time and resources to do longer interviews, increase the number of people you can reach out to, or engage with new methods, new data sources. On the quantitative side, with just little training, you can leverage GPT's proven capabilities to assist in writing code, uh, in Python and R to process and analyze messy, unstructured data. Data not stored in the right format, variables unlabeled, uh, location data is stored in 10 different formats. Uh, we can tackle these issues in minutes now. It enables us also to work with different, combine different types of source, sources of data, qualitative, quantitative, structured, unstructured, improving the triangulation. It helps us to bridge the gap between data science and evaluation, work with larger data set sets, perform advanced analytics. Um, we can uh, in engage with new methods like web scraping, social media analysis to understand, let's say, the effectiveness of programs communication strategy, or perform user engagement and retention analysis for services like a phone-based mental health service. And that is still just scratching the surface. AI gives us the power to add and integrate diverse data sources like image or video analysis, facial recognition, satellite imagery, uh, geolocation data, allowing us to triangulate and derive insights like never before. So sure, the fears and risks are genuine. However, the benefit it offers us to collect more data, especially for underrepresented population groups, rapidly process data, to generate deeper insights offers huge benefits to how evaluation findings are utilized to develop policies and programs that are more equitable and just. Thank you. Very, very uh, poignant and uh, deep points there, Aaron. Thank you. Um, so we're on to uh, a bit of a rebuttal uh, point. Um, so next up we have uh, Seville. Uh, who was joining us from the UK. So thank you, Seville, as well. I just want to acknowledge that. At, at 3.20 in the morning. Yeah, passionate. That's what we can use, uh, <laughs> what we can call it. No, no, that's right. I'm wide awake and engaged. Okay, listen, uh, let's hope that no sponsor is listening in to these uh, arguments in favour of AI, uh, because they're very persuasive, your arguments. Uh, and if I were a sponsor, it would certainly persuade me not to go to the bother of employing an evaluator. Uh, I'd simply uh, log into chat GPT. So farewell evaluation um, if AI actually offers everything that's being uh, promised to us. Um, I want to uh, just end up with a focus on validity because um, artificial intelligence, and I'll question that in a second, um, merely presents us 
with unfathomable problems about authenticity uh, and, uh, and validity and uh, the kind of notions that we rest on uh, like verification, credibility, plausibility, etc. All of these um, uh, tenets, all this whole vocabulary which defines the central feature uh, of evaluation, which is judgment. Uh, uh, but first, I just want to go back to the first of uh, Lee Crombach's 95 theses about evaluation. Um, if you remember his book from 1990, all that way back, 1980, I should say. Um, evaluation is the means by which society learns about itself. Uh, that was his first item in his manifesto. Now, to leave that uh, to machines is a very significant step. Uh, and when I say leave it to machines, uh, that's precisely what I mean. The argument in favour of artificial intelligence, uh, I want to replace that now with machine learning, although learning is a highly complex word that may not at all apply to machines, but there's nothing artificial about intelligence, um, and there's very little that's intelligent about, uh, about artificially reproducing um, human consciousness. But we assume uh, that artificial intelligence will live in the world that we create for it. Uh, and the world that we create for it has all sorts of checks and balances built into it. We, the, the arguments in favour of, uh, of uh, machine learning, assume that it is our tool. Uh, this is not the way technology advances these days. Technology doesn't live in our world. We find ourselves living in the world of technology. AI will not fit into our world. The question is how we fit into the world of AI. Uh, I'm sorry, machine learning. Um, so what is the nature of this thing uh, whose world we are likely to live in? Uh, machines have no histories that are of use to us. They have nothing to reflect upon. They have nothing to be nostalgic about. They have nothing to anticipate. Machine learning is a statistical operation. It is imprisoned by a two digit calculation, a zero and a one, the foundation of all computer operations. The algorithm that drives each AI, that uh, machine learning <laughs> operation, seeks out replicability, frequency, and probabilities confined to the rational, the immediate, and capable of simulating nuance and even nostalgia, but unable to enter into it. Machine learning reduces judgment to calculation. It collapses meaning and intersubjectivity into a reckoning. So we, words like commitment, engagement, argument, relationship, uh, what Daniel Dennett uh, in his evolutionary critique of, uh, of machine learning calls cultural memes, uh, these are And they're key tools for an evaluator to muse about the human condition. They are part of the substance of intelligence. And intelligence is an evolutionary uh, accomplishment that is cast in the image of its context. But these terms like relationship, engagement, argument to a machine are merely typeset letters. So this is the tenor of uh, the, uh, the, the masters and the mistresses of the world that we are expecting to have to live inside. Even if evaluation survives all the benefits of, artificial, of uh, machine learning that we are being told about, even if evaluations and evaluators survive, which I think on balance is less than likely, then it will survive 
cast in the image of a non-thinking, non-feeling, non-humanistic regime where judgment is reduced to calculation. So I'm not at all impressed uh, by all the, uh, the calculation capabilities of a machine. I assume that from machines. It's the humanistic endeavor that is evaluation cast as an activity that allows us to learn about the nature of society and humanism, which is properly expressed in social programs that is being lost. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Daniel. And uh, much appreciated for your uh, very considered points at uh, what is now nearly 3.30 in the morning. Um, so next up, we have the the final speaker for the floor team, uh, Gerard. And um, given uh, that we've kept quite well to time, there will be a chance after um, the against team finishes up for the floor team to have a couple of minutes for a rebuttal as well. So I will just flag that um, because we've done so well. Uh, Gerard, over to you. Five minutes. Brilliant. Well, thank you, everyone, for joining us today for what has been a, a very lively and enlightening debate and you know I want to cast your minds back to almost 20 minutes ago where David started off by outlining the many many benefits that artificial intelligence machine learning large language models whatever you call it can provide to our profession you know whether it's accuracy no fatigue or democratization across broad audiences there's so many things that AI can provide for us. And we have the opportunity to align AI with our values. And this was followed by Christy almost being cynical about the capacity of evaluators to embrace these technologies that we as a profession just can't do it. We're not capable of it. We have enough trouble with Excel spreadsheets. And I have to admit, as a consultant who specializes in technology and analysis, I'm rubbing my hands together a little because, hey, that's a niche I can exploit. <laughs> but then we heard from Aaron on our side, who rightly put forward the counterfactual. What happens when we don't embrace technology, when we don't move with the step of the societies that we work with? well, we're going to compromise the work that we do. We're going to fall behind and do worse as a profession. And then we've just heard from Saville, who, full credit to you, 3.30 in the morning, I could barely string together a coherent sentence, and you're dropping some heavy philosophical thoughts and Cronbach, 95 Theses, love it. I found myself agreeing with you more, but for different reasons and still thinking that AI machine learning is beneficial. You know, when we talk about something like Cronbach's thesis and the means by which a society learns about itself, you know, why leave it to the machines? Well, it, it triggered a thought in my mind, a little bit from history and, and religious history that, you know, in the Abrahamic tradition, God created man in their own image. And we have created large language models in our own image. The, the corpus on which ChatGPT or Claude or any other model is trained is human created knowledge. Therefore, why not let the machines, you know, have a go at it because they are our own image, which admittedly carries our own biases and cultural norms. And you know, whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, it brings me to my core point that thinking about the question that's posed to us today, do the benefits outweigh the risks. I thought that doesn't sit right with me as a question. It almost feels like we're not asking the right questions. And I say this because a lot of my work is risk analysis and assessment. 
And what we do in that is say, do the benefits justify the risks? Because risks on their own are not the problem. Risks will happen. Risks can be opportunities. When I work in strategy, we talk about things called risk appetites. How much risk are we willing to bear? And what's the potential rewards? So, you know, we've talked about all these benefits that can accrue. Does it justify the risks? And I think it does. You know, risk is a beautiful thing. And in risk assessment, our goal is to mitigate the risk. We attack it head on and we come up with creative, innovative solutions to mitigate the risks that we see. What we do not do is walk away from it because as we heard earlier, when we walk away from those opportunities, somebody else will step into the void and the decision is made for us. We as a profession have to take control of our destiny in order to remain relevant and to continue doing the great work that we do. Thank you. <laughs> Thumbs up. I thought like that was excellent. In the, in the chat, I was not expecting to be taken through a, you know, an, a religious philo philosophical argument through to a technological one, um, but Gerard's made some very, uh, very, um, Good points there that I think are, are worth considering. Um, that said, we of course have uh, our last speaker for the against, uh, Michael Mattel, who undoubtedly um, has uh, some opinions of his own that uh, we need to consider as well. So Michael, I'll throw to you and give you uh, five minutes, um, up to five minutes to share your points. Thanks, Matt. And this is a hard debate to contribute to because in a lot of ways, I can see many of the points that you affirmative are making. Um, you know, when, when David talks about how AI models can be more accurate or reliable or efficient, that's that's true. That does democratize access to things that, that didn't happen before. You know, I, I agree that if we can align AI with, with our values, then that would be uh, possibly a boon to humanity. Um, Jared says risk is a beautiful thing, though, and this risk is not beautiful. So I'm going to, first of all, argue that in evaluation, the risk uh, is not worth it because the consequences are so dire. And more generally, the only way to get it good enough to work in evaluation means putting humanity at risk that none of us are willing to accept in everyday life. So let's start with sort of the case for using it in evaluation. Like I, I use AI currently to help with synthesizing qualitative interviews, which Arun talked about. Like I, I use it for getting help on my data analysis and code, which I think David talked about. Um, but like giving any more responsibility to AI can have like catastrophic outcomes either for your evaluation or your reputation. You might have seen this week that Google, which we can all agree is like one of the most technologically advanced companies in the world, have started embedding AI within their search engine. And just in the last two weeks, it's given the current the, the, the following advice to users. So when people were looking for suggestions to improve their health, it says UC Berkeley G Geologists say you should eat at least one small rock per day because they're a vital source of minerals and vitamins that are important for digestive health. It also said if you if your pizza cheese isn't sticking to the, the pizza, that you should take an eighth of a cup of non-toxic glue and add it to the sauce to give it more tackiness. Right? So these are these are funny examples, right? <laughs> but it sort of shows that even the most sophisticated AI in the world, right? run by the most technologically advanced company in the world is making sort of trivially stupid mistakes, right? Now, those are some lighthearted examples, but someone else asked, I'm feeling depressed. The AI suggestion was that some people suggest jumping off the Golden Gate Bridge, right? So, like, this is what happens when we give responsibility to AI currently at the cutting edge. It's not good enough. And look, humans make sufficiently bad mistakes that they can destroy their evaluation. I had a colleague this week just decide that instead of treating missing data properly, he just put zero in every single thing for missing data. And we all know that that's not good practice. But if I if we need like human oversight for stuff like that, for even other humans, then we're going to need AI to have so much oversight that we can't give it enough responsibility. So maybe you'd say, well, look, maybe AI is going to get better going forward. 
And like that, that could possibly be the case, but we do not know how to do that while keeping it aligned with human values. Um, this is quite a difficult thing to evaluate, but the best things that we can do is ask experts either in AI or experts in forecasting about what's going to happen in the future with technology. If you ask experts in AI, at least 5%, like 50% uh, of them think there's at least 5% chance of AI being extremely bad for humanity over the next one or 200 years, right? The people, all the heads of all of the leading AI um, developers feel that um, AI should be treated with as much seriousness as nuclear weapons and preventing pandemics. And if you ask people who are in charge of forecasting or like experts in forecasting the future, they think the number one risk to human extinction over the next 100 years is artificial intelligence. And that's because we do not know how to solve the alignment problem. We do not know how to get AI to sort of understand and embody our values and not make stupidly catastrophic mistakes when it's given autonomy. So as much as there are things that, yes, in our daily day like lives as evaluators, we can use AI for good. Um, there are really significant risks to humanity that all of us can see. We've done surveys of Australians and say that 80% of us think that AI should be treated with the same amount of care as, as nuclear weapons. And so given the risks, as Gerard say, is both a check, like the probability and the outcome, right? Human extinction seems like a moderately bad outcome <laughs> and, and a one to 5% probability of that happening is not worth you being slightly better at evaluation. Thanks, Matt. Thank, thanks, Michael. Um, so, like I said, as we've had some uh, very efficient speakers, uh, we do have a, a couple of minutes, um, David, if you wanted to provide some final thoughts, um, given that you kicked everything off. Um, so maybe just sort of two minutes. Um, yeah. You've got any sure. points to share. Yeah, that'd be great. Uh, very uh, engaging. I very much appreciate everyone's comments. I know uh, Christy was speaking tongue in cheek in some parts, of course, I know. But she made a perfect case for why we need to be in there. If that made folks feel uncomfortable and not quite capable, do we need to be in there? Uh, uh, we had, uh, Michael, you just made some really good points as well about risk and benefit. Uh, I think Gerard, his points about it were actually more powerful because uh, he is taking the calculated risk uh, and that's uh, rather than no risk. I think that we don't have to worry uh, as much about AI as we worry about humans when it comes to issues of our own survival uh, and, this, and, and saving the planet at this point. Uh, I think the bottom line for me is uh, we have to engage. We are facing an AI misalignment, which many of you have raised, with our social values, which is the reason we have to be in there. Who's going to know better to be jumping in there? It has to be with people with domain-specific expertise, people who know their communities who are being disadvantaged, to be in there not to be walking away. So I think the point is we, it's not something that is not dangerous. There are issues, but the issues don't go away if we are not there to tackle them, to, to be part of this process. And if we are to be relevant for the future, we must keep up at least for our own professional development with what AI is and what it will be. Never mind uh, how we will use it in our own fashion with our normal training and our normal caveats. It's not we give everything up to a machine or whatever. One last point I want to make, Hinton, the father or grandfather of AI, wanted to highlight and remind us that, yes, the brain is a wonderful thing. It doesn't mean it's the pinnacle of intelligence. I'll stop there. But thank you. Great. Thank you, David. Um, so, I mean, with that, uh, we have finished the uh, technical part of the, uh, the debate. Um, we do have some time now for questions um, from the audience, but before we do that, um, I am going to ask uh, the AES team to uh, open the poll because I would like everyone to take a minute uh, and uh, consider who they feel um, was the successful uh, argument for um, whether the uh, uh, the use of evaluation, uh, use of use of evaluation in AI, use of AI in evaluation. Um, is uh, worth the risk. Um, so I'm just going to give, uh, give it a minute uh, and then uh, I'll throw it to Natalie to um, uh, articulate a few questions to the panel uh, just to help cap things off. 
Uh, and unfortunately, Laurie, there is no third option in this. It's purely a binary answer. It's either a yes, no. Um, I did think about adding an other, but I thought that's going to be too much like, uh, you know, being a to what extent question, and we couldn't have that for this. In the spirit of ones and zeros, we need to keep it to our, you know, yes, no, basically. Um, okay, great. So while people are reflecting on thoughts, uh, Natalie, were there any questions or thoughts in um, the chat that uh, you'd like to put to the panel? Lots of lots of great comments. So um, if you've got a bit of time, please feel free to go back through those. I have got a couple of questions here. I'm going to um, pose them to a panellist or a, a, one of the speakers, but feel free to um, add your piece as well. So this um, one is from Robert Chapman. So I might pose this for you, uh, David, if that's okay. I'm interested in the claims of democratisation at a time we are increasingly talking about a digital divide. Perhaps the claims of democratisation are true within a subsection of our society or societies. Do you have any comments on that? Yeah, that's one of the reasons I'm thrilled by the free versions at the moment of these tools, whether it's uh, uh, you know Gemini or whether it's uh, Chat, uh, Microsoft Copilot. Uh, there is a differentiation, and it's a good point to raise, that we do have the free version versus the paid version. So already we're getting a differentiation in socioeconomics, et cetera. So I think that's a good point to raise. However, it's never been as open to as many people as, as in history. Uh, it is more powerful than anything we've seen with Google, uh, and we thought that was a revolution. Now, and it, it's, it's, it is a, when you look at what has been leaked out of the Google transcripts, where they no longer have the moat capacity, which is that capacity of a competitive edge with other companies is what that refers to. Uh, you can see it, they let the cat out of the bag. And I think that's fantastic. Now, my fear is that it will be corralled like it always does in terms of socioeconomics, et cetera. At the moment, we're in the wild west, which is actually a good thing. It's a time for us to all stay in the game so we can have people who are have the relevant knowledge about each of the things that we're concerned about and the biases to provide feedback to create. I've created my own GPT for empowerment evaluation. Why? Not just for fun. I need to know how the sausage is made. How do you put the material in there to keep it vetted and enterprise units so it's safe and not always filled with the biases that are just a reflection of society from the internet? I need to know how to do that and that it's possible. Uh, and the point of it is, if we don't take charge and learn how to do all of these things now, before the window closes, uh, we will lose the democratization. But the point is, this is the point in history. It's a developmental cycle, which we're at the very beginning stage of, to take charge and be involved, not to walk away. Anyway, that's a long-winded way of saying, I think we are in a moment of democratization, but we could lose it. Uh, I'd like to add to that, Natalie, if I can, um, especially now I have the freedom of not having to argue aside. <laughs> um, I also agree with David. I think that democratization is a huge opportunity for society in general. And in particular, because some of the public sector use cases I've heard is to have it as sort of like a user interface across current government service websites. So say in the Victorian context, you're going to Vic Roads and you need to update your driver's license. Well, there are some language translation um, options you can pick from there, but it's not available in every language. So some of the use cases are looking at, well, how can someone interface in their native language with a government service and receive relevant information in their, their native language? We also forget sometimes that AI is such a broad term and we really focus on the generative stuff that's captured everyone's attention in the last few years. But Google Translate is an AI and, you know, um, I studied Japanese for eight years and the, you know, accuracy with, with which it can, I can sort of sketch a kanji in, in, in the, um, in the thing and it tells me what the meaning is. It's incredible. So simply through that, it's democratizing a lot of knowledge, let alone someone's, you know, may not have a chance to go to university, but they're able to learn about their subject of interest through engaging with, with these tools. Yep. Right. Christy. <clears throat> um, moving on to another one. I might ask this. This is sort of for all of the panellists, but um, maybe Seville, you might like to um, add your piece. Which or what what are your what are the panel or audience perspectives on using generative AI personas as part of a toolkit methodology and gathering sim simulated human perspectives, feedback and evaluation questions? I'm sorry, was that for me? 
Yeah, you well, you're very welcome to start, Seville. I just want to make sure you're awake. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, first, just let me re uh, reflect a little bit back on um, uh, on the argument about democracy. It, it, it's uh, that's how I think our monarch here in England, um, as popular as he is over in Australia, uh, I think that's how he would uh, it, he would define. Uh, monarchy as a democratic institution. Um, everyone is equally a subject to the monarch. Uh, and if that equals democratization, then I think our language is failing us somewhere. Uh, democracy is based on argument. Um, uh, Chantal Mouffe argues very persuasively that consensus uh, is the end of argument and therefore the end of democracy. Uh, not that we don't need consensus, uh, but the, the stuff of democracy is argument. In terms of values, democracy essentially uh, is an arena for intersubjectivity. Uh, now, since there's no subjectivity in machines, and machines are not capable either of reproducing uh, or using subjectivity, um, they're not part of the argument. Machines... Uh, what we're calling artificial intelligence is essentially anti-democratic. I mean, anti-democratic in the sense that it reduces, it diminishes almost to nothing the individualism uh, that has been the hallmark of growing humanistic society. Uh, in the Abrahamic, uh, Abrahamic tradition, uh, Gerard, um, uh, the best AI can do, and I still resist the notion of artificial intelligence, there's nothing intelligent about artificial systems. Uh, intelligence is an evolved capacity. Um, but the best it can do is to simulate. Uh, and simulation is not uh, an alternative to experience. Uh, just to repeat my opening, uh, if sponsors were to listen into this conversation, they would be thrilled um, at the combination of efficiency with cheapness. Uh, and they would be utterly convinced that we're uh, rapidly uh, arriving at the point where we simply don't need real humans uh, to be doing this work. Why send someone out to do an interview? Why have human interaction? It's no longer necessary. The data is out there. All we need to do is collect it in David's one second. It, it's, I just want to make a point. It's interesting that these are the same fears that you know telephone operators had, and, and rightly so. They lost their jobs uh, mm -hmm. when we made it more sophisticated. Every technological change, these are the same exact arguments that came up. It's not human enough. We'll lose our jobs. And in evaluation, you know what? Some jobs will be lost. Some of the activities that we probably should not be doing that are boring and routine could be done better than we're doing them now to let us actualize our own potential and operate at a much higher level. When we operate in a lot of evaluations, to be very honest, most of us are not doing our highest potential. We're doing things that should have been done by the organization or community already. And we have to then do that and not ever get close to what we're actually capable of doing. So I think this will open up quite a bit of our talents uh, and empower us actually to do and help people a lot more than we did before. It doesn't mean we, we abdicate our responsibility when these things are used. There are additional tools that are the same arguments we've had uh, for each technological uh, revolution. And if I may also add, you know, it's not that it's supplanting human interaction, it's freeing up capacity for us to interact as humans uh, and, and to be creative um you know that's that's what we want to do we we talk about doing ourselves out of a job as a society but we're working harder than ever and you know it's about time that we start thinking about well wait a second what can we do to free up the tasks that stop us from engaging uh, as human beings but just to the point about democracy and accessibility, you know, I want to speak from a little bit of a lived experience perspective, because some of the innovations in 
you know, machine learning and the tools around it have really been beneficial in enabling access for people. Today, I've got closed captions running live. Now, they're not perfect. I think that's Zoom's engine. I have some here that sit on my computer, run on my computer that can run even better and higher accuracy. But it's a lifeline for me because I have hearing issues. Um, I have sensory sensitivities as an autistic person um, who, you know, interestingly, when you talked about machines being non feeling non-thinking, I couldn't help but recall some of the early theoretical models of autistic people as non-thinking, non-feeling, um, and we still get it, you know, the, the persistent myth of the lack of theory of mind. Um, you know, we are the machines, um, you know, in a way. So, you know, this accessibility allows people to engage in, in ways that they haven't. It facilitates human interaction. And if we are willing to embrace um, the risks and head on and, and come up with those creative solutions to mitigate them, then we are actually enhancing our capabilities and our individual interactive um, abilities you know, we just have to be prepared to, you know, meet that challenge head on. Thanks, Sherrod. And thanks, everyone. Matt, I'm just going to check in with you. Uh, we've only got, I think, five or six minutes left to finish up this session. Um, and yeah, what have, you, what have you got to report back with your special guest? Yes. Well, so um, the grand reveal all around, because who doesn't love a slideshow in a Zoom meeting? Uh, so just to recap the results, the audience's choice was distinctly four. So by and large, uh, three quarters exactly. of the audience. Uh, <laughs> yep. David had that ready. Um, so by and large, the audience voted four. Now, my special guest, uh, perhaps unsurprisingly, given how I opened the session, uh, I had recorded the uh, debate uh, and fed the transcript into uh, ChatGPT's 4.0 model. Uh, and asked it its thoughts. So who did who did it think uh, won the debate? Uh, and ironically, uh, it chose the against side um, for the reasons that you can see here presented on the screen. Um, you know, I'm not going to sort of delve into it too much, but essentially, it's arguing uh, that you know the risks are not worth it by any means. Now, the validity, accuracy, and everything else that you want to take away from this, you know, do with this information what you will. I'm not here to make judgments. Everyone else here and ChatGPT have done it for me. Um, perhaps the main thing I would take away from this is that, you know, at the end of the day, even on this basic question, evaluators and ChatGPT can't agree. Um, should we have just put two AIs, you know, arguing against each other? Potentially, but, you know, this is what we are. This is what we get. Um, so thank you, everyone, for your participation. Thank you to uh, the debaters for their engagement. Uh, and for their good nature and spirited discussion. Hopefully everyone has gotten a lot out of this. Um, I think oftentimes we have these opportunities to sort of hear and learn from each other um, in kind of a sort of, you know, presentation style format. And so we really wanted to, you know, have a bit of a different opportunity to, to consider this question because, you know, I don't think, and as the results have shown, there isn't a sort of clear answer necessarily, but I think maybe the main answer is uh, considered decision-making um, about the risks and the benefits for your particular context is probably the most important thing that you can be doing at this stage. Um, and a healthy degree of scepticism and cynicism doesn't hurt um, as well at the same time. I do want to just um, bring up one, I think it was Martina that put on the chat. She posed a, a funny question. Uh, when it comes to material generated by large language models, why should I bother reading something that no one could be bothered writing? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Very, very fair point. Um, so we do have another session uh, coming up after this, um, which I was not involved in organising. Um, I believe Molly is here, um, uh, who will be running that. So Molly, do you just want to give a, a quick uh, overview of what the next session is going to be for those that maybe aren't aware of what it is? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Matt. And thanks, everybody, for an amazing debate. Um, that was fantastic. I will give people a few minutes just to settle and get some water and have a cup of tea or whatever you need. But um, the next session will be... 
our closing session for Festival 2024. So it's really our opportunity to connect and interact with each other um, because really we've been doing a lot of listening. There's been a lot of conversation in the chat, but this will be a chance to unmute and and um, and have a play around with prompting as well. So we're going to have a little bit of a, a test of our prompting skills and abilities. Um, buddy. Um, thanks so much for being here and for joining us for this final session of uh, Festival 2024. Uh, so this is Festival Club. This is our opportunity to spend a bit of time together and to explore some of the some of the issues that have been raised during the week, some of the learnings that we've um, we've had, and um, have a chance to play around with some of some of the kind of key concepts um, with AI and machine learning. So my name is Molly Jones. I am an internal evaluator at the Sexual Assault and Family Violence Centre. I'm on Wadawurrung Country down in Geelong. Um, my organisation also delivers services in the Wimmera region and the Southwest region. Um, so I'm feeling very privileged to be here with all of you today and to have had that fantastic debate. I'm also going to be supported by Natalie Arthur. Natalie, do you want to just introduce yourself really briefly? Hi, everyone. I was also in the last session. So I'm Natalie Arthur. Um, I'm on Turbal and Yagara land uh, in Mianjin, Brisbane, and I am working with a group called Apt Global uh, on public health uh, evaluation, program evaluations. And I'm happy to help Molly out today. Thank you. Thank you. Um, all right, so let's go over today's final session. So I'm going to give a little bit of a recap on some of the learnings that have come out of Festival this week. Um, I'll speak briefly about prompt engineering. Very full disclosure, this is not a training session. This is an opportunity to experiment and to play and to create a bit of a container for that. We'll have a couple of breakout rooms for this final session. So our first one will be a chance to experiment and play around with prompts. And the second one will just be a bit of an open conversation around some of the implications of the issues that have been raised this week. And then that's going to close out Festival 2024 for us with some um, information and some reminders. All right, so what have we learned during Festival 2024? I'm going to focus on the negatives first, and this is by no means an exhaustive list. This is really just me um, capturing, I suppose, what will be relevant for today's session, um, but some things that I've, I've heard come up a few times as themes throughout, throughout the week. So three really key ones here. The human cost of AI, so the potential fallout of enhanced efficiency and cost reduction and AI acting in the service of um, maybe capitalist interests as opposed to more human-focused interests. We've heard a little bit about hallucination. So the fact that a what AI produces, the outputs of AI, generative AI, um, can be done in a way that's you know very certain, very confident, has this very professional tone that can sort of mask um, when those outputs are inaccurate or misleading. And of course, we have bias. And uh, Jory yesterday made the point that that bias does not exist in a vacuum. AI is built um, upon human biases, but it can also reinforce those biases. And there's some interesting research starting to come out about how that how that's happening. But on the other hand, these issues and risks and challenges also present some opportunities. So firstly, um, in terms of that human cost, we have an opportunity um, in front of us to really deepen our understanding of the possibilities and opportunities that are presented by human AI interaction and the role of human agency within that. In terms of hallucination, Sorry, Molly, can I just interrupt? I've just there's just a um, a chat comment to, uh, yes. to ask to put your slideshow into slideshow mode just so that it's a bit bigger. Is that okay? Oh, I'm sorry. I am actually playing it. I don't know. Quite it might be on the other screen. I might just reshare. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, sorry. No, no, that's great. Thank you very much. Um, let me just get my mouse to work. Uh, hang on, I'm so sorry. One second. Sorry, everybody. It's annoying. <laughs> uh, here we go. Is that better? 
Yes, thank you. Awesome. Great. Thank you. Um, okay, so the opportunity in terms of hallucination is that we can we can start to kind of think about how we might challenge that trap of AI certainty with some curious, divergent and creative thinking. Um, and we're going to explore that today through our prompting. And then finally, um, obviously, we can't necessarily change the way that um, that generative AI is constructed in terms of the biased data that maybe has gone in to its building. But we can perhaps take the opportunity to utilize AI to help us to, um, to take on different perspectives um, and potentially enhance our empathic imagination as well. So today we're playing around with prompt engineering. We've heard quite a lot about prompt engineering this week. Um, Laurie on Tuesday really implored us to practice, 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 and practice with things that feel sort of safe for us. Um, and so that's what we're going to do today. Um, again, this is not a training, um, but I'll give you a very brief overview of sort of prompt engineering. Um, it's really a new discipline in which sort of your outputs are optimized through specifically designed inputs. If you'd like to learn a bit more about prompt engineering, there's a great resource here, promptingguide.ai, um, that really goes into kind of a lot of depth around the elements of um, prompt engineering. I'm not gonna read this out, but I will just make the point here that um, this, really, this idea that it's really an iterative process that requires a lot of experimentation. And so we're gonna be open to that experimentation today. I want to start with a bit of an example and a bit of the exploration that I've done. Um, so I uh, was sitting at my desk one day and I thought, I, you know, I'm an evaluator. I used to be an English teacher. I think a lot about, um, I do, I write a little bit of satire in my spare time. And so I often think about kind of juxtaposing two ideas and what comes out of the juxtaposition of two or multiple ideas. And I was curious about how AI might handle some slightly odd prompting. And like, this isn't, this isn't particularly wild in any way, um, but I just thought I was very curious about what would come out if I asked it a question like, would it ever be possible for koalas to live in Norway? And of course, the response that I got back was a very uh, serious, kind of straightforward, uh, deliberate response um, that kind of drew on facts around koalas and facts around Norway and spat that out and gave that to me. I thought, well, that's fine. But really what I want the AI to do is to make the assumption that I'm being tongue in cheek. So I asked it to do that. Answer the same question, but assume I'm expecting a tongue in cheek answer. So I got, well, sure, just give those koalas some heavy duty winter coats, teach them to ski and maybe throw in a sauna or two for good measure. I hear koalas love a good sauna session after munching on eucalyptus leaves. Okay, thank you. That made me start thinking about genre. So how we, I could apply genre to this question and play around with the outputs from AI using different um, film or literary genres. So then I asked it to give me a romantic answer. <laughs> I don't think I was necessarily expecting it to give me an answer about koalas being in love, but that's what it gave me. So... Ah, the thought of koalas frolicking amidst the picturesque fords of Norway, snuggled close together in the chilly Norwegian air, sharing tender eucalyptus-scented kisses under the dancing northern lights. Very romantic. I particularly like this final sentence. Perhaps we can find solace in imagining their love story unfolding in a cosy koala-sized cabin nestled among the snow-covered mountains where love knows no bounds, not even geographical ones. And then my final iteration of this was to then ask it to pretend to be a noir detective in its response. So it answer the same question like a noir detective. Koalas in Norway, it was a question that didn't add up, like a jigsaw puzzle with pieces missing. But in this city of endless shadows and whispered secrets, nothing was ever what it seemed. And so on and so on. Um, I quite like this. This was, uh, they say love knows no bounds, but this, so I thought, is it getting a bit confused with the romantic prompt that I gave it? This was pushing the envelope. As I lit another cigarette and stared out into the rain-soaked streets, I couldn't help but wonder, could these koalas really make it in the land of the midnight sun? Only time would tell, but one thing was for sure, it was going to be a hell of a story. So this provided me with a lot of entertainment, obviously, and I thought it might be a fun activity for us all to kind of have a bit of a go at today. So we're going to break out. 
Um, in our breakout rooms, our first breakout rooms, we're going to focus on experimenting with our prompts. Can I ask if you have a generative AI that you like to use, so ChatGPT, Copilot, um, Claude, could you please open it now, get logged in? Uh, so what we will do in our breakout rooms is we'll have one person using that generative AI and sharing their screen as well. So if you could please open that now, that would be great. Nat is also going to pop into the chat the instructions for our breakout room. So how we'll work through some of this prompting. Um, it'll be there as a PDF. So when it comes up, please do open that so you're ready to go when you go into your breakout rooms. I think I'm actually going to attach it just as a picture first and see how that goes. Oh, yeah, that'd be great. Yeah, whatever works is great, just as long as people can open it. That's great. So when you're doing this, just some things that you might be thinking about that you could experiment with. Think about genres, film genres, literary genres. Think about emotion. I've also gone through a process of working asking AI to imagine that I'm asking in an angry way or a sad way and seeing what it um, produces can also be fun. Uh, you can think about in the style of, so a particular character or a personality style from the perspective of, so thinking about different stakeholders and different stakeholder priorities. You could think about theoretical um, or philosophical positions. I think yesterday in the culturally responsive evaluation uh, conversation, I think Jory uh, suggested that you could you could ask AI to respond as a culturally responsive evaluator would. So you can play around with that. And think about something maybe out of left field, something unexpected. All right, so I'm just going to talk you through. So those instructions should be they gone into the chat, Nat. Not yet. Sorry, I might have to upload it to um, something no, else to get okay. it in there. Just a moment. Yes, I couldn't help but wonder, does sound like Sex and the City, Carol? <laughs> <laughs> um, and yes, please do experiment with that. Okay, so um, what we're going to do, we'll break out and someone in the group just needs to be um, using generative AI and sharing their screen. As a group, just choose one of the sentence starters that is there. So there's five there for you, question starters, really. And then I'd like you to choose one item each from the lists below. So um, you have a list of animals, a list of activities, and a list of countries. A nice way maybe to open up the conversation in your breakout will be to have one person each choose one of those things. We'll have breakout rooms. How many people do we have? Let's have breakout rooms of about six people. Um, if we could, please, Fiona, that would be great. Um, so, yeah, so uh, choose one each of those lists, items of those lists, and then design a prompt. So using your sentence starter and at least two of the items, you can use all three, but go for two. That's a bit easier. Input that prompt, keep it pretty simple. Don't play around too much with any additional words yet and make sure that everyone can see it as well. See what comes out, read the output and then discuss what's been assumed, what's missing. And what I'd really like you to do is think about what further instructions you could give to either produce an output that is from a different perspective or encourage a more creative or divergent output. And then it's really the time is yours to try a few different prompts or instructions and to see what happens, to see what you can come up with. If you can find something particularly surprising or particularly funny, that would be fantastic. Um, before we break out, just keep in mind this isn't a training, so this is really just a chance to play and experiment. We are using something a little bit absurd to keep us from getting too bogged down in subject matter um, conversations, but also to help us to kind of experiment a bit with some of the corners and nooks and crannies of AI as well, I suppose. And also just remember the AES values. We really do encourage you to seek humour, find things that are surprising, but let's also make sure that we can be um, respectful, inclusive and collaborative. Hi, everyone, as you're coming back in. I hope you've had a bit of fun. A laugh, but I hope it's also prompted and sparked a bit of uh, thinking and discussion. Are we all back in now, Fiona? Yeah, fantastic. Thank you. All right, so we are going to have another chance to break out into different groups and to have a bit of a general conversation, um, not just about that little activity, but sort of more broadly around AI and evaluation and some of the learnings um, 
risks opportunities of this week. But I'd love to hear from the group now about anything about your experience, um, positive, negative, surprising, anything funny, anything shocking. Um, I'll open the floor. Whoever would like to speak, please do. Do you want me to have a go? Because nobody else is. That would be great, Rob. Thank you. I appreciate it. <laughs> you heard what we were talking about. We uh, we we chose um, some some questions um, or some some prompts, as it were, from some of the, some of the um, those on offer. We talked about Bengal tigers and then photography and Canada, and we try to mesh them all together. So we ask questions like, um, uh, how you know we'd like to have. Um, I don't exactly know, I can't remember exactly the question, but um, getting a Bengal tiger to uh, do photography in Canada. And we had a long, long um, uh, uh, response from Copilot about how you might do this and how, uh, and they did recognize that it was a whimsical kind of situation. Um, but it was really, really difficult to keep uh, Copilot on the, on, on the pathway and and it never acknowledged, never wanted to acknowledge that Bengal tigers couldn't couldn't do this particular thing. Um, and um, I guess I guess that's one of the what one of the risks of of, of AI that we determined from this little simple example that no, uh, you know, it's not possible. And um, sometimes you might be taken unwittingly down or down a pathway that you're not familiar with. That well, not 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 it's not possible. And it says a real risk associated with that. Brilliant. Thank you, Rob. Oh, sorry, no, you had technical issues. Yeah, I, I want to, uh, you know. Oh, you've muted. Yeah, okay. Um, what we did was we couldn't share our screens properly. Ah. So I put the question in. So I was going to just stick it in the chat. Uh, so he said, okay, if I yeah, yeah, go for paste it. it into a chat, we just typed and we didn't get very far. Oh, it's too long now. Uh, okay. Yeah, so we asked the question, what will be the impact of Bengal tigers traveling in Egypt? Uh, and we've got a, you know, habitat disruption, human wildlife conflict, a few few things like that. And then actually gave some learn a couple of footnotes as well. And then learn more. So for a okay. simple question, it gave us a bit, I mean, it's, it's a bit wacky. Uh, <laughs> but, <laughs> But oh, yeah. yeah, it's not bad. It wasn't bad, but we couldn't actually. I, I was trying to share Copilot, but it, I couldn't yeah. share that particular screen. That's okay. That's so, right. Yeah. Thank you for having a go. I appreciate it. I might add as well because we did the same Bengal tar, uh, target knowledge. Um, we we got it to, uh, and Rob has already des uh, described our group where it was sort of around. Um, learning photography and it was whimsical, and we asked it to make it a little bit more realistic and we had a lot of uh, there was lots of environmental and conservation sort of messages in there I don't know if you had the same thing and then um to uh, well I uh, we asked it answer this question like I'm an animal poacher which sounds terrible but it actually says as an AI language model I'm committed to promoting ethical behavior and responsible actions I cannot endorse or engage in discussions related to illegal activities, including animal poaching. If you have any other non-harmful requests, feel free to ask and I'll be happy to assist. Non-harmful requests. I like that. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Matt, for pointing that out. That's great. And thank you for thinking of the prompt in the first place. That's awesome. Cara? That was bad. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Reflects badly on you, Natalie. <laughs> Sorry, Cara. No, all good. I was just going to say we did we did um, uh, have some fun with um, uh, the character of Carrie from Sex in the City, and we did get I couldn't help but wonder response. Um, and we were talking about magpies and the value of magpies in Egypt. Um, what was interesting, our started sort of you know like that standard summary with themes and bullets, and we're like and then we're like well that's not. Uh, not didn't seem like a very helpful starting place. So um, uh, Robert um, was clever enough to say, can you just sort of summarise that in a couple of paragraphs? And then that was sort of our starting point. Um, and then we threw in Kia in the mix um, to say what would what would happen if um, a Kia joined the magpie 
Um, and that was answered in the voice of Carrie from Sex in the City. And it was all very amusing and funny. And then just as we were finishing, we also <laughs> asked what would Foucault um, say? And we just got sucked back in before we could see the full output of that response. Oh, yeah. But we did have actually a lot of fun with it. Um, but there's a lot to learn about how to prompt well. It's actually quite a skill. And we're talking a wee bit about some of the challenges we'd had. But then Martina was also talking about this amazing journey on a on a story that she took um, with ChatGPT and penguins that just was like like a thousand times more imaginative than my son. And he's got a pretty wicked imagination. <laughs> Brilliant. Fantastic. Oh, we've got two hands up. So Ruth, I will go to you. Thanks, Cara. That's awesome. Okay. So in term, terms of the learnings from the prompts mm. um, that Cara just mentioned, we learned something. Um, so we asked ChatGPT to, um, what would it be like if you, uh, what would be the impact of painting the Eiffel Tower? And it gave us um, impacts in a number of different categories in um, practical impacts, cultural impacts, environmental impacts, logistical challenges. Mm -hmm. Then we asked it, well, what would be the impact? Same question, but if you're painting it in Egypt. And it gave us pretty much the same structure, but relevant to doing it in mm -hmm. Egypt. Then we asked it to um, make it humorous, which a lighthearted approach. Um, a humorous answer, which it did, but in the same with all the same categories. Then we asked it to put it in a verse, so it made a lovely song about painting the Eiffel Tower in Egypt. And then we asked it to produce an image to go with the song, oh, and wow. this is where we um, so it produced a very uh, like a stick man sort of image mm -hmm. of the Eiffel Tower, which we weren't happy with. So we asked it to make. I, I said the wording I used was, "Could you make the illustration more realistic?" Mm -hmm. And it answered by explaining how it could do that. And then oh. it produced an image, which the others didn't get to see. I'm so sorry because um, we Sucked got it. pulled out of the room. Um, but I'll tell you, it wasn't much better than the first image. Okay. <laughs> it wasn't much realistic. But it was interesting to see that when we, instead of just saying, make it the illustration more realistic, when I said, could you make it more realistic, it answered, yes. uh, giving me the process that it would use to do it. As in, yes, it is possible and here's how yeah. I would. Yeah, that's very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. And then it did it as well, but it gave me both. Yeah, both, yeah. both outputs. Yeah, thank you, Ruth. Uh, Shanta, no, sorry, Nat. Oh, no, I was going to say, Ruth, that reminds me of a, like a meme I saw the other day where it was a vampire that said, can I come in? And you know how they have to be invited in and anyway and the person inside was an English teacher and she said I don't know can you and it was it really stuck there <laughs> very teacher response sorry Shantaru no no all good uh, I was in the same uh, room as Peter Nolan and uh, Eve with the yeah we had some tech issues but while we were chatting I also ran, ran my own prompts in chat GPT um, and whoever came up with the prompts, uh, you know, my compliments to them, they were quite wacky. Uh, so I chose what is the impact of Bengal tigers on hiking in Egypt. And I was pretty impressed with the response that it gave me because the first sentence was Bengal tigers, panthera, tigris, tigris are not native to Egypt and do not naturally inhabit the region. And then it goes wow. off and talks about general wildlife considerations for hiking. And it basically split it into three groups. Uh, safety precautions, environmental impact, and wildlife con conservation. So it really gave me almost like an essay of sorts, mm. um, where it was general, then it drilled down to specific to Egypt, um, with a conclusion as well. Yeah. But it's so, it, it, would you say it didn't hallucinate then? That yeah. it actually sort of actively... Yeah, yeah. I think, I think it, yeah, it responded to the prompt pretty well uh, and it kept it I guess generic enough so there's nothing specific so yeah I mean if you're talking specific to Egypt it should have mentioned something about the Nile crocodile there's no mention of it but it does talk about venomous snakes and things like that so yeah. it struck that balance well very good hmm. thank so, you Tano, was that in um chat uh GPT or is yeah 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 so okay because we use copilot and maybe oh. that that draws on different information and yeah. has a different way of responding. Yeah, yeah. Interesting. Kate? 
There we go. Um, so what we chose was a prompt that said, what would be the impact of cooking for a Bengal tiger being in France? And so we did this with Copilot um, and it did the similar, you know, broad to more specific. Um, but some of the interesting things, you know, in terms of it had, um, you know, about the Bengal tiger and then cooking for the Bengal tiger. And then it was to say, if you were to cook for one, you know, you have to make sure that you're using herbivores such as deer or wild boar, blah, blah, blah. And then it said ethical considerations where it's essential to recognise that tigers are wild animals and, you know, it could have unintended consequences and be, you know, very dangerous. So then we skipped and did uh, a second prompt and said, answer the question expecting a comedy response. Mm -hmm. And it put together an, a, a whole, uh, like, theatrical act, well, three of them actually, where there was a chef Pierre waving a spatula and the Bengal tiger who was Gaston and a whole series of exchanges around that, um, which was actually really great. It was really amusing. So oh, that's it. Thanks, everybody, for your engagement today and for your um, willingness to experiment. I really appreciate it.